<clears throat> Hello, everybody. We're going to start in just another minute, so please take your seats. We're expecting more arrivals, but we just want to get started because we're almost at um, 7.30 now. Officers over there, that microphone on the stand is, should also be live if you guys need to grab it to answer a question or make a comment. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. I'd like expecting more arrivals, so um, it's great to see the turnout. Uh, tonight's a real special night, and uh, Community Board 3 has been uh, planning and preparing for this for some time, so we're very happy to um, be able to do this today. Special guest tonight is um, Mr. Vincent Bradley. He's the chairman of the State Liquor Authority, and we're very happy and very appreciative that he took time to come here tonight to speak to us. So uh, without any further ado, I'd like to just introduce uh, Mr. Vincent Bradley and thank him for coming. Thank you. Uh, with me tonight also is uh, Sharif Kabir, who is a, our executive deputy um, commissioner, and Mike Jones, who many of you probably know, who is an assistant CEO and in charge of the New York office. And he's been the regular contact with the community boards for going on nine years now? Nine years, yeah. yeah. Um, I've been here about, uh, I just finished my third year as the chairman. Um, and we have been making some changes at the Liquor Authority that I just kind of want to describe to you before we start taking questions. Um, we're in the process of putting together a new uh, web page. I don't know if any of you have utilized the current web page, but it's probably about 15 years old and is basically an antique. Um, the one that we're putting together now should have a, a great deal more information, particularly for the community boards. Sharif is actually putting together an entire list of frequently asked questions, not just for community boards, but also for licensees. Um, it's not available. The process of putting together what's governor's office, they are uh, automating basically the entire licensing process. Uh, you will basically get online and answer certain questions about what kind of business you want direction of what type of license with the liquor authority you should be seeking as well as um, need to have. So it should, uh, it should be something that we're over the course of time, we've been better and more efficient at doing it, but um, it's something that we're always striving to do to try to get them completed as quickly as possible so that the businesses can get up and running as quickly as possible. Um, and I can't answer, or, or these two guys can't answer, we will um, write down and, and, and get an answer back to the community board when we get back up to Albany um, tomorrow. So. If anyone has any questions, unless you want to say something, Mike, do you have anything? No, nothing to add. Okay. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, uh, to begin with, actually, the community board has a community board Uh, consider and process and uh, to hear from applicants. Uh, the person who's actually responsible for a lot of hard work is Mr. Edmund Rosenbaum, who's um, the head of the um, Business Economic Development Committee. So he actually um, reviewed the questions and uh, we'll turn over the mic to him and have him ask some questions. Okay, thank you. First, I just want to mention how many licenses go
have 198 off-premise licenses, which are grocery stores, liquor stores, uh, drug stores like Walgreens, and wine stores. And on-premise, we have 197, of which 109 of those are full liquor, either being restaurants or bars. And there are also five hotels included within that uh, statistic and a catering hall. Uh, currently, we have about 20 pending applications within the district. We usually see a pretty high volume, especially as it comes towards the summer months in terms of people applying for licenses. And uh, I just want to get into the questions and then What can be done about licenses, licensees who claim to operate a restaurant but become illegal bars and nightclubs after dark serving minimal to no, no food? Well, one of the biggest obligations we have as a board when we're reviewing applications that come before us um, is the method of operation of the licensee. And that is something that, as, a, as the chairman and, and my other commissioner as well, we take great pains in asking questions of the people before us that if you're going to be a restaurant, what are you, why do you need to be open to four? Why do you need a DJ? Why do you need live music? And we try to avoid those instances as much as possible. The whole process relies on people telling you the truth. urge the community to do is to have a DJ is using a DJ out and it turns into a nightclub after 10 o'clock you file a complaint with our office and we we will send an investigator in there and it, undisclosed he will observe what's happening at that time in the evening and if there is um, the situation as you described it, we'll either call, if it's in New York City, we'll either get together with the New York City Police Department and do a march operation, um, which is a complete inspection of the bar, which we have every right to do it. And there will be charges filed. And those, when that happens, member of the board do not take those charges lightly. Um, that's something that is not just a problem in Queens, it's a problem in Manhattan, it's a problem in Brooklyn. And frequently what happens is we get people who are applying for licenses and they really have the best intentions. They want to be a restaurant, it's their dream, it's what they always wanted to do. And within six months they realize that it's not bringing in survive. So then they morph into something else. And they're not allowed to do that. That's why our Kind of music are you having? Using DJs? Are you are you uh, publicizing on social media? When I get that this place actually morphed into a nightclub after eleven o'clock at night, um, we come down very hard on them. Okay. Uh, and I know that's a problem on Roosevelt Avenue. I met with Sen the senator. I believe well, is he still here? Uh, but I, we met a year ago, or a little, uh, probably a little bit more than a year ago, regarding Roosevelt Avenue, and he expressed his concerns about what was occurring there. And we have been paying enforcement-wise uh, particular attention to that area. Okay. The follow-up to that does involve Roosevelt Avenue. Uh, recently, uh, the New York City Council removed a majority of the New York City cabaret law, and upon clarification. Um, the use group. thing which is against the law in the first place but for those locations that previously held cabaret licenses and they uh, the dancing and the entertainment 
Is there a necessity for that to be printed on their license under the method? I'm not following you. They they are dance. They are allowed right. to dance. Dancing music. No. Does that um, what would be what the way this law affects really doesn't affect it in my mind at all. If if we enter into a condition with a licensee when they apply, or you all enter into a stipulation with them when they apply, if one of those conditions or stipulations is no dancing, then it doesn't matter if it's legal or not. I mean, a DJ is legal. But if the stipulation or the condition says it's not not legal here, then they're not allowed to do it. Um, that's something that goes with the license. It has nothing to do really with the cabaret law. Okay. Okay. Um, still on Roosevelt Avenue. Um, I'll give the context of it after the question. Uh, why is the state liquor authority granted waivers on on premises liquor applications? to establishments that are in conflict with the 500-foot rule on Roosevelt Avenue. And the biggest example is there are nine on-premise licenses on our side of the street, which is the north side, between 78th and 79th Street. It's a deep well, I, think there, I think you may law. The 500-foot law requires that the community board have input on the granting of a license. There's no waiver okay. um, that we grant. It, it, we, we are required and we do um, pretty much 100% of the time take that input. Now, how we use that input, we try to, to weigh it against the licensee as well. So th there's not, it's not a, a blanket waiver. We always, what many community boards do, particularly in 500 foot law cases, is enter into very strict stipulations with the licensee. If that occurs, then we try to adopt 100% of those stipulations. Um, if there are one or two stipulations that they are not agreeing on, I try to get them to agree on them because they're not going to like neither. Neither party's going to like my decision because it's going to it's going to go against both of them to some extent. But our our job is to weigh. Um, both sides. I mean, frequently in 500 foot cases where the community board is opposing it outright, um, there's just as much support um, from community members that the licensee or the applicant has brought with them. So it, I'm going to tell you it's easy. It's not because, particularly in the instances where they're telling us that they're going to be something. And a year later, they're not that something. They're, they turned into something else. So um, it's, it's a very difficult thing, and we try to do the best that we can with it. But it's not and – and I always take the community board's opinion, uh, particularly when they, they appear at the hearing or they put in written materials. What we find very difficult as a board is when the community board just sends us a resolution that says we're against this applicant because it's a 500-foot law case. That doesn't give me any information. If we're against this applicant because there's four clubs around it and this is going to be another club, that's specific information. That's helpful. If we're against this applicant because we know that he was part of a bar or a block away that was problematic, that's helpful information. Um, or that there's residents above the bar. As, spe as specific as they can be with the resolutions, the more helpful it is to me because for me just to say, they're objecting to this because it's a 500-foot law case is not helpful at all. Jim, I just uh, what the chairman was discussing is the 500-foot rule, and it seems that a lot of people are confused with the 200-foot rule, which is within 200 feet of a church or a school, where the SLA cannot, by law, issue a license if it's within 200 feet. So in that case. If it is, you're not getting it. Where the 500 foot rule, because the way you phrase your question is like a waiver, it, it, it's discretionary. So as he discussed, we have to balance all the information and it's discretionary. So they have to show it's in the public interest. And uh, I'll save my comments on the 200 foot rule because that's just another uh, can of worms. 
I was going to ask a question about the, <laughs> since you mentioned the 200 foot rule about the exclusivity of the use of the property, that um, with a 200 foot rule, it's uh, 200 feet within a, of a church or a school. Mm -hmm. And the definition of what that would mean about exclusive use of the building. Exclusive use of the building. I, I have a conservative view. However, if there was of this building unassociated with the school but leased out a part of it, that would affect the school being, uh, or the church. It happens more in churches, but that would affect. What happens a lot, particularly in Queens, and are apartments above them that are leased to residents. They're not affiliated with the church. They're just uh, residents of the building. That is... Now, like Mike said, that we don't have any discretion in that. If that is 199 feet, if it was actually a church, and it's 199 feet and 10 inches to the door of the, the bar, we can't put a license, an on-premises license there. We can put a, a restaurant wine license or a tavern wine license. But um, we don't have any discretion in that. And when we do have a question of whether it's exclusively a church or a school, there's a, a tremendous amount of case law out there that guides us in that. So, um, you know, it depends on what kind of uses you're talking about, but it's usually pretty obvious. What, if you're having bingo games in the school, that doesn't affect it. Uh, if you're having, using it for AA meetings, that doesn't affect it. Um, it's mostly if you're using it for something that and is there a range of grades in terms of a school? Like, would a pre-K be included within that? Uh, the preschool and pre-K, I don't believe pre-K is included. Yeah, it's kindergarten and up. So, right, but people do call about daycare centers and... They're not included. Yeah. Right. And that, once again, is not a discretionary thing. That's, that's legal. Right. A few more questions. Um, you had mentioned Roosevelt Avenue. We do have a relatively large saturation of licenses on Roosevelt Avenue, on 31st Avenue, and also on 103rd and 104th Streets in Corona, going from Roosevelt up to 37th Avenue. What can we do to um, curb any oversaturation that could happen? Well, it sounds like you probably are close to it now. I mean, it was probably a year and a half ago just about this issue. and. Since that time, if there is something that comes on Roosevelt um, because of that, means they pay for uh, or two places on Roosevelt Avenue. Um, there, are, there clearly are businesses there that have indicated to us that they are restaurants and they're not operating as restaurants 100% of the time. And like I said, when we get that complaint, we will go with the police department and investigate them. Um, but if it's a new application, if you bring that to our attention specifically, um, you know, I try, if it's an application on Roosevelt Avenue, I basically tell them they're not, pro they're, not they're probably not having a DJ, um, which is the biggest issue in my mind uh, on a restaurant because it, it turns it into a nightclub very quickly. Okay. Within the licensing process, um, we've had a number of establishments, at least in for about corporations for different reasons. Um, Assuming that it was a different applicant, um, we know applicants are researched very carefully, and if they had any adverse history, they would be penalized for that. Uh, would an address itself have any bearing, the history within a location on a new applicant? It has a history in that we get all the information about who was licensed there previously, and it, it I certainly take it into account. What I'm not allowed to do legally is hold it against a new applicant who has no history. So if that applicant comes in and says, we're opening a completely different place, we're familiar with what the history was, that applicant has no bad history in other places, um, I have rejected licenses on those grounds and I've been reversed by the, by the appellate division. Um, so legally, I, I can't do it, but if there's a bad history with the applicant and a bad history with the place, then we certainly take it into account. But I do weigh, if it was a club before, and this person is opening a club again, and there was huge problems with the club the first time, 
the, I'm going to limit the hours. I'm going to limit the music. I'm going to limit as much as I can to make it so that if they plan on being this club, it's going to be as hard as possible for them to operate like the other place was operating. I'm going to fill it with security guards. Okay. On Northern Boulevard, um, there are a lot of rear driveways and very long lots in terms of the locations. And I have this in ring. It's very hard for us to just, we, we don't have the resource to. Um, so that is a very serious violation if they're have, using outdoor space that they're not licensed for. And we take that very seriously. And once again, the minute that we get that complaint, an investigator will come out in several, within several days as, as undisclosed, will try to buy a, an uh, alcoholic beverage and walk out into that area. If he's allowed to do that, then that's a charge. Uh, in and of itself, and then once again, hopefully they will then call the police department and do a march operation as well. Let me just, uh, we have the general complaint on our website. Here. The community board. Uh, uh, there, the, there's a, on our website, uh, there's a complaint, a general complaint, which goes right to our enforcement bureau and they review. The community board has their own email address, yeah, CB right. complaints that I review. So if someone complains to the community board and they forward it, and then uh, I have a personal email address that I review complaints as well. So extension of premise cases are serious for us because chief complaint in the city is 3 1 noise complaint. So that means backyards, rooftops, and when they apply to us, they're defined the area, uh, the diagram show where they're allowed to serve alcohol. And if it's not part of the licensed premise, it's a violation. And the summer months are coming, so I see that coming. It's not just here, that happens upstate as well regularly, and, and it's at a minimum extremely expensive. Um, but if they have a history, they could lose the whole place, so. Okay, what is the authorities? Um stance on the visibility within uh, these businesses in terms of tinted windows, curtains, things along those lines? Well, that's a, a charge within the ABC law that we're supposed to be able to see in a premise. And the curtains, when you talk about a lot of the charges we get with the curtains are um, that they're, they're flammable. Um, and that ends up being discovered during a march operation with the NYPD. They either do it themselves because they're very good at, at finding those violations or our investigators will go with them. Um, and that, that is something that's a correctable violation. I'm not going to tell you that that's the most serious violation, the visibility, although the curtains are. I mean, when we, when we find the curtains, that is a fire hazard waiting to happen. And we take that very seriously as well as frequently we find exposed wiring um, and then blocked exits, and that's just a nightmare waiting to happen. Okay. Uh, with prostitution, both on the uh, court level and on the state liquor authority level, one specific one is on their second or third uh, time already. You have a name uh, of it? I don't think I want to. Oh, okay. No, I'm just saying, you know, just the, uh, how long would it take uh, for, how many tries do they get till there's a revocation or a cancellation? Well, without knowing, and I you know, um, there could be two open cases. So definitely within the third one, they're going to get revoked. Um, what, what many people don't understand is, um, with these violations, we bring charges. And m much like a criminal case, you then have a due process that begins. And 95% of our cases end in some type of settlement with the licensee, whether it be a cancel of the license because of their history, or whether it be a monetary fine or a suspension. But for those licensees that choose to take the due process as far as they can, they end up going in front of an administrative law judge with one of our prosecutors, and there's a full-blown hearing about the charges, and we bring the police officers in as well as our own investigators who test if they go that far. Um, and that that's why I, I frequently will have open cases, but I can't act on open cases because when they do go to hearing, they do occasionally win, um, which means that, yeah, we brought charges, but they weren't sustained. And it's much like getting acquitted at a criminal trial, that we just start all over again. 
Okay, and then we have a number. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. The drugs and prostitution charges are actually the most difficult for us to prove because we have to show that management was aware. So they'll arrest some people, and generally they'll have undercovers performing this, and their testimony will be an undercover says, "Well, I met the uh, person, and we we went to the bathroom." I mean, they're doing their best to hide from management. So although some people arrest charges going through a hearing a lot of times it's difficult to sustain these charges so that's another thing that we have to factor in okay there are numerous locations that have i guess you would call it unregistered trade names of which they've either not had a trade name or they have changed it and haven't notified um the state liquor authority and also there are some that have notified the state liquor authority so in both cases um would the community board have to be notified of that? And what would happen to those who no. notify anyone? Well, I mean, if they're not notifying us, um, that's a violation. Uh, they can't. That, that's an ABC uh, law violation. It's not, I'm not going to tell you it's a very serious violation um, because it does happen that we, they are supposed to notify us. We do have an application where they can change their DBA, doing business as. And um, many just don't realize that they're supposed to notify us when they do that. Um, they would not have to notify operation, um, what I do ask is, even though they're not required to by law, I do ask the community board to come to us and ask that method of operation. Okay, we'll go back over with Mark. We'll go to Robert. We do? Okay, good. A couple more questions. Um, um, I just wanted to, um, we see situations where you have a bad owner and they will, uh, they get shut down. Uh, and then they reopen under a different name, and maybe the the employee now becomes on paper the operator. Um, how does things like that take great the next applicant about any relationship they had with the former owner? And we also go. They were a former employee. I immediately obviously have suspicion that this is just a straw operator, and frequently will deny the license based on that fact. Um, but once again, it does require people, they don't always do that. So I'm not gonna tell you that they haven't, I guess probably an extremely cynical person. So I generally don't give them the benefit of the doubt if there is, you, you know, it's very, I'll give you an example. We did one in White Plains um, recently where we shut the bar and it was actually two bars that were connected and we, we did a, a summary suspension on both of them and uh, Four months later, this young lady came in who had all this experience working in hotels and she she was put on a great presentation. She was uh, very articulate and very uh, able to, to talk about what she wanted to do with the establishment and know she didn't have any relation with the former owners and blah, blah, blah. We granted her the license. Within 10 days, one of my investigators was on Facebook and saw that she not only was related to the former owners, but she had a child with one of them, um, which we then shut her down within 10 days. But that's somebody who was able to, you know, convince me um, because of her experience and because of her um, ability uh, that she was able to get along. We do get taken like that, which does not, I hope, happen a lot. Um, we do act on it when we find out about it. Uh, another uh, honorary district manager of community experience where operate certain hours uh, to the SLA, come back and extend specified or should be enforced? No. Community boards, uh, licensees have a right whenever they want to. If they're looking for an extension of hours after two months and they've shown that they're going to tell them don't bother coming back before a year. But um, I, I generally don't tell people to not apply. Um, just because I, I think they have a right to do it, and my job is to review it, um, and just as your job is to review it as well. So I don't know that that's going to necessarily do anything mm -hmm. if you tell them not to apply in two months. Well, we now, if you want to say we suggest if you want an extension, but they it, that shouldn't that's not going to I extension of hours in two months. I can tell you that, particularly if the community board stipulated on the hours. A year, I might. I mean, in a year we do, I'm not going to say regularly, but we do do that. There's not a lot of 4 a.m. licenses that I've handed out since I've been on this job. and um, Most 
of the, particularly in, in Manhattan and Brooklyn, um, most of the bars and restaurants do not have 4 a.m. licenses. In fact, if there was a 4 a.m. license there and someone bought the restaurant, that's an asset to that restaurant because we don't give them out much because of the community board stipulating the hours, even though the law allows them to be open before. Right. Coming off of that, we've had applicants uh, come to us saying since the law allows them to open till 4, they want to open till 4. Well, they all want to be open till 4. And it's they say it's their right, so they're putting till 4 o'clock. Well, it's and not. And also that their last call should only be 15 minutes before 4. I haven't I, – I, I don't really differentiate between last call and my – the way I do it is I, I tell them it, it, it's 2 o'clock and that means you're closed. That means they're out. You can do last call anytime you want, but if the police walk in there and it's 2.20 and people are still drinking, there's a problem. Um, they don't have a right to be open till 4. The law allows them to be open till 4, but that's why on 500-foot cases, on 500-foot law cases, the community board has input on the hours, and I obviously, uh, or as a member of the board, have input on the hours. Um, and like I said, there's not a lot of 4 a.m. licenses that we've given out in the last three years. Now, some cities, it's regular. You go to Buffalo, most of the licenses are 4 a.m. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment about the DBA violation earlier. Uh, when I first started, I, I considered that a huge problem because many of our licensees don't give us a DBA at all, and it's difficult for law enforcement to track them down. I mean, I'll use an example. The Greenhouse in Manhattan where Drake, in that fight, uh, they didn't have uh, someone that precinct called up and said, what do you have in the Greenhouse? I go, hold on, I can't find it. So it's very frustrating for us. But <clears throat> when you see a place close for a number of weeks or uh, and then reopen and they say grand reopen a new name and a new thing that that's indicia of probably other things going on that we're concerned about generally i've seen that there's a new owner who we don't know about and uh, a whole new operation coming in they'll make alterations so uh if you see a new name i'm very interested in that and then uh usually the community board will follow up with, yeah, there's a new guy out front now, and there's another guy presenting himself as an owner. So the, the, that's a bigger uh, concern of ours when we have people who we don't know running the place. Okay, thank you. I think at this point uh, what would be nice to do is to maybe start at one end of the panel table and just uh, go down uh, over from the corner um, and just introduce uh, yourselves and you know where you're from and if you have any comments to make about um, this discussion, feel free um, to uh, weigh in. And I don't think I was remiss in introducing myself before. I'm Phil Pappas, I'm the chairman of Community Board 3. Hello, and just introduce yourselves, and if you want to say a few words. How's it going, folks? I'm Officer Signer. I work at the 115 Precinct. As of right now, I'm scheduled to work four buys, which is a 3 to 11.30 shift. I live out on Long Island, and uh, I'm here to answer any questions. How are you doing? My name is Lieutenant Cedillo. I am the uh, platoon commander of the Roosevelt Avenue Task Force. We deal mostly with the nightlife, so uh, any problems you have as far as the clubs, restaurants, at night, usually from 9 to 5, we cover 37th Avenue all the way to 41st, from 72nd Street all the way up to 114. And I have three sergeants and 28 cops right now uh, designated. And everything else that goes with that, and also um, graffiti in the, in, the, in the neighborhood. Hi, how is everyone? I'm Officer Barry from the 110 Precinct. That was my partner. Uh, I work on the anti-crime team. Um, I'm a, like an undercover unit. Um, I work with the undercovers, and we go inside all of the port or like and things like that. Uh, I go in there um, with an undercover, and uh, we'll do like underage operations, and. Uh, you know, check if they have like the, the right signs or their, uh, you know, like their exits are blocked, things like that. We'll write the summons and, uh, and that's it. Yeah. That's what I do. And I'd like to uh, just say um, a thank you to the NYPD because, as I mentioned, um, our Business Economic Development Committee meets once a month uh, prior to our full board monthly meeting where we do the public 
uh, hearing and the, the vote of the full board on uh, these applications. So there's a lot of um, review and a lot of work that goes into and a lot of legwork um, that Mr. Rosenbaum uh, does. Uh, he also does their part because they come to our committee meeting and are generous input on uh, certain locations or just uh, what's been going on in the neighborhood so that we really have a good picture of, uh, of what we're reviewing and, and where to go with it. So thank you to you guys for all your hard work and your help. Uh, Uh, the building code and the New York City, New York City zoning resolution. Uh, in order to use the backyard, backyard use must be indicated on the certificate of occupancy, just by occupancy, or a letter of no objection must be. So uh, we have with no letter of no objection. In addition, place of a C is seven inside or under seventy-five, and once they open up into the rear yard, the ninety-five. So. Um, New York City Department of Health, and we work very closely with both NYPD and the SLA in both the March operation and any other operation that they have um, for enforcement. But our primary responsibility is that we inspect restaurants to make sure that they're safe and sanitary for everybody. I just wanted to add something on, on the Certificate of Occupancy. Um, within the last year, and I don't know that this community board is, is doing this, but many community boards are coming to us and saying that the applicant has the wrong use group to have a restaurant where they're trying to get a liquor license. Well, that's not really something that we review. That, that's the Department of Buildings. What we require before the liquor license is granted as a condition is a C of O that says that a restaurant can be there. Um, and similarly, if they're using the backyard and they want to drink in the backyard, the same thing, that they have a, a C of O that says they can do that. But it's not our job because, you know, there's, we do the whole state. For me to analyze every zoning, buildings is the agency that will write the violation, and when they do their violation, then we will also do a violation, um, probably closing the place, or not closing it, but basically taking their license away. Because um, if there's not supposed to be a restaurant there, like I said, it doesn't matter if there's alcohol being served or not. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, I want to thank everyone on the panel for showing up tonight and taking part in this. I also want to recognize um, in attendance is our state senator, Mr. Jose Peralta. Thank you, sir, so much for coming. Um, did you want to say a few words? Um, I'm sorry, can you describe the mic for a little while? And for a while, SLA and myself, um, particularly on Roosevelt Avenue. And because of that, I've introduced legislation on several fronts uh, to help out with the situation that's happening on Roosevelt. Um, yes, that 500-foot rule is a problem, particularly in certain, on certain streets of Roosevelt Avenue where you do have um, a few locations that, that are four or more establishments, and I'm hoping that once they come up for renewal, the community board will take that into effect and into consideration so they can, they can make the recommendation. But um, I've introduced legislation that talks about creating a community liaison for each community board so that when they have recommendations to this level, um, then they can talk with SLA um, and, and constantly be on top of it. There's a lot of community boards across the five boroughs, and there's very limited amount of people. I know Mike does, does a great job, but there's very limited amount of people that are out there um, so that they can have that one-on-one -on -one, uh, direction. So that's one piece of legislation. The other piece of legislation is to create a, a commission with all the different agencies, NYPD, FDNY, um, sanitation department, Department of Health, Consumer Affairs, actually pops up, right? That's a little bit more complicated because you need a universal program. And that's something that I know that the NYPD sometimes can't share information with. But that's something that, we're, that I've introduced and we're working on. And more importantly, and most importantly, is the little known fact that although there are millions made by SLA based on their um, fines and the violations, all of that goes into the general fund. It doesn't go back to their agency. 
So I have a piece of legislation that says, well, if you raise $10 million, you, it should go right back into your agency. Now, politically, they can't say that, but I can. <laughs> um, on, on fines and violations, or $15 million or $20 million, whatever the amount is, it automatically goes back into their agency as opposed to going into the general fund, and then they're raking in millions of dollars, and then it goes into a general fund, and they can't see, um, they can't get, and no, there is a consistent push in what's happening um, because bars and night places keep on opening up. Uh, so they need to stay on top of this. And those are the pieces of legislation that I've been pushing up in Albany, and uh, hopefully come January when uh, we're back into the majority, uh, we can move. It is something that we have in particular because of Roosevelt Avenue, um, whether it's the NYPD, whether it's the FDNY, um, whether it's the task force, believe me, I've talked to all of them, and it's constantly, uh, not only on the prostitution end, on the $2 dance bars, on the 500 foot violation, on uh, the massage parlor places, you name it, like, we, we've been talking to them about it. But SLA in particular, um, we've been having discussions, but they are underfunded. They are underfunded, and that's something that needs to change. And the only way that they can improve and they can, they can go out and, and, and deal with these issues appropriately is to make sure that we increase their budget. So, thank you. You proposed legislation um, that would allow community boards to, rather than respond to to applications, uh, expand that time. Please, can you tell me what uh, where we are with that uh, with that uh, proposal? Yeah, that's uh, still stuck in committee. Uh, <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, for those who have been following up in terms of what's been happening up in Law Albany for the last few weeks, um, uh, there's been an impasse. Um, so we're at a stalemate up in, at least in the Senate side, and the Assembly is fine because we have a supermajority. But in the Senate, there's an impasse because there are 31 Republicans and the 31 Democrats. And you need 32 members to actually pass anything on the floor. So. For those who feel that um, the lieutenant governor can actually break the tie, the answer is no, she can't. Um, we tried that uh, and it's failed. Um, she, can, she cannot do an actual vote uh, for legislation. But that piece of legislation in particular is still tied in committee and we have about seven days left of session, um, official days of session, and all the official committees have shut down which means that now all the bills, the only way they can move is to be moved through the Committee of, on Rules. And the only person who controls the Committee on Rules is the leader of the State Senate, and that is Senator Flanagan. So it's still in committee. Question, question. Yeah, um, for the Police Department 115th and 110th. Um, we know that you work very closely with the State Liquor Authority. Would you say that conditions, particularly on Roosevelt Avenue, are getting better, the same, or worse? As far as what? <laughs> we have numerous. Uh, we have numerous uh, violations, well, crimes. I, uh, well, as it relates to operations, uh, bars, uh, as it relates to, to bars uh, and establishments uh, with liquor licenses. It definitely has uh, improved. Um, they, I think it's a combination of uh, the joint operations that we're doing and also we have implemented a, uh, and I see a few faces that I saw a couple of days ago, we do monthly meetings on a precinct level now where we invite all the bar owners and it has been proven very, very effectively because they, they now are very close to us and we have a very, uh, I say, a strong uh, open line of communication. So where there's, whenever there's any issues, any problems, they immediately call us as opposed to a couple of months ago where they were kind of scared to call 911. So that has helped as, as well. So um, it has also given us the opportunity to, uh, to give them information 
So that coupled with the joint operations, yes, it has helped uh, a lot and it's getting better. Captain uh, Salibas is the Captain Salibas is uh, he's the commander, right? He's, he's the captain. The captain. Of the captain. Of the year, yeah. So he's the captain of the task force. And let me tell you, it's night and day in terms of what's happened with the task force. Uh, previously, there used to be um, I used to hound the the task force over and over and over again uh, on particular places um, of prostitution. If, if you know Roosevelt Avenue, you'll walk up and down certain streets and you'll see the um, lookouts on, on different corners. You'll see that they stand on different corners and they'll know when the cops come in, rather they'll turn around, they'll make the phone call, they have the earpiece in, the, in, in their ear, and, and they'll alert uh, the next guy that the cops are coming. Um, usually I used to tell the, the, the captain before Salibas that um, the only time that they were, went away was when Con Edison was doing work or when there was a parade because they knew the cops were around. Um, but um, Captain Salibas and his team now have really got that on lockdown and, and they've, gone, they've shown us on a, on a monthly basis um, what activities happen up and down the different streets. Um, because as you know, like 70, 79th Street, 78th Street, there's some, there's some um, <coughs> parking lots that, that go in and out of the, of the apartments, of the, of the buildings um, or the homes and some of the activity happens within those parking lots. Um, but the task force has done a great job in improving that. Yeah, I'd like to echo that actually, and just again, uh, shout out to the NYPD for doing such a great job working with the community board. Um, Captain Saliva and others uh, from the 115 for sure, they've come out. Um, in addition to the Business Economic Development Committee, we have a Public Safety Committee, so we've been meeting uh, recently, um, and the NYPD has been attending those meetings. And there's a lot of overlap, of course, in these areas, not just about liquor licenses, but then you also have, you know, um, uh, public safety and crime issues that happen around the bars, as the senator just said. Um, it even gets into transportation issues sometimes. It's an infrastructure problem where there's inadequate lighting, uh, say, in a street like Roosevelt, where you have the uh, train overhead, and it's a lot to work on. But police has been uh, great. So thank you so much, guys, and want to continue that uh, work together. Another question. <laughs> One more question for the State Liquor Authority. Um, when you have a new applicant, do you look at their experience as relates to the operation of a restaurant or a bar? And uh, if it's a restaurant, um, we um, normally, to the applicant, particularly if they're new, if they would consider a wine and beer license rather than a full liquor license, uh, would you have any, obje uh, any objection or suggestion as to whether that's the, the right approach? Well, I, I don't want to tell you what the right approach or the wrong approach is. I, I mean, to answer your question about whether we consider their experience, yes. Um, we have their employment history over the last five years. If they have no background in running a restaurant and they're opening a restaurant, particularly if it's a restaurant that's in a problem, that a location that has been a problem in the past, meaning we either canceled a license there or revoked a license there, then it is going to affect um, what we allow them to do as far as hours, music, um, things of that nature. I don't really, you know, I know that there's a big um, push to say restaurant wine rather than full on premise. Um, and I understand that, but really the thing that I've seen, uh, particularly in New York City, is that the the problems develop when the music and the hours are extended. So if you let a restaurant, and I understand there's a lot of restaurants now that, that want DJs and it's part of their business plan, but if you let a restaurant have a DJ and open till three in the morning, it doesn't matter if they're gonna be an on-premise full liquor license or, or a restaurant wine license, the same problems are, are likely to occur. Um, so I try to deal with it with the hours with the number of security guards that I ask them to have and with the music, particularly if they're inexperienced. Um, she can ask questions. I'm Maureen Allen, Chief of Staff to Assemblyman Michael Dendecker. These are the outdoor uh, premises that granted we know that if you want to have drinking out there, if you're serving food out there, 
but is the owner of the bar slash restaurant told that they need to police that, for example, people smoke, so they go outside or they'll go into the back, the backyard, to have a cigarette and they carry their drink with them. Well, so there's two situations that you're describing to me. One, where they're drinking outside and they're not allowed to be drinking outside. That um, certainly is a violation for the bar owner. He's required, he's required to police that area, and if it's not licensed and someone's walking out of his bar drinking and s staying right there and they're, they're letting them do it, then yes, that's a, that's a major violation. If they are allowed to go outside, they still are required, they're required to police any area that's licensed. Even if it's in the backyard? You know, yeah. Backyards. Yeah, I mean, if a fight occurs out there and the backyard is licensed, it's on the owner. I, I know there's one catering hall in Queens, that actually the only place I've ever seen it. And yet, people do go outside to have a cigarette. And they take their drinks with and, them. And just to clarify, there, there also is noise coming from front of the bar and it's bothering residents. That's on the bar owner. Um, and if they're drinking out there and not allowed to be drinking, that's obviously a more serious violation. It's all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Me? Um, okay. Um, just speak up because I think I, they want I you have, to be able to. I have a couple of questions. Well, I have a lot of questions. Number them. Just let everybody know you're a board member. David was there, a community board member. Yeah. Repeal, that's good for your heart, for your soul, good for everything. And then um, I heard something what you're saying here that certain places they cannot allow to be dancing. According to the regulations I read, is everybody can go to dance any place, with, whether you have a license or not. Uh, I, I would need clarification on this. And for sanitation, uh, uh, circuit, uh, I mean, I'm in the health department. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, pardon me. Okay, I'll, I noticed I'm chairing the community board uh, three, as, as you know. I'm co-chair for sanitation. And uh, it's a problem with a lot of them being crucified with some of violations or in the restaurants. While the people selling on the streets, you allow to let the people sell on the street food that we don't know how they produce and, and so on. I don't think it's justice for all. Thank you. Well, as far as I'll answer your dancing question, I can't really get into the sanitation, thank goodness. Um, I, I think what we're saying, or what I was saying, is that what goes on at a licensed premise, we have a lot of discretion to dictate, whether there's a law that allows dancing. Most, most um, municipalities in the state never had a cabaret license. There was no such thing. But that doesn't mean that we couldn't tell a restaurant that there shouldn't be patron dancing in the restaurant. And the only reason that would be said is because you're a restaurant and the community is not looking for a nightclub. I'm a big fan of dancing myself, but it, I think everybody needs to know what is going to be at a licensed establishment and they need to know how it's going to affect the neighborhood. I think when you look up and down Roosevelt Avenue, that's probably what occurred here is, on that street is that people were saying they were one thing and they've kind of morphed into other things. And that's the only thing I was saying about dancing. I mean, it doesn't mean that dancing per se is illegal. It just means in certain establishments and certain zoning won't allow it either. Um, there's still certain zoning in the city that won't allow dancing, even though there's no cabaret license. But that doesn't mean that we won't, we're not, we don't do that for every license. Yeah, we might uh, what, what, what people are forgetting is the application in the method of operation I believe it's page 14 so this is the applicant telling us what they're going to be doing and then we specifically ask will they be dancing if they check the box no that is what applies it's your application to us and when you told us when you applied you said that there'd be no dancing <coughs> so the cabaret issue is separate but the way to remedy that 
is they could file a method of operation change with us. Now, I, I was expecting 70,000 uh, those applications to come through, but you just can't start dancing because, because it really didn't have an effect on you. You never said you were going to dance with us. And uh, so that, that's, as well as the zoning issues uh, of operation that you tell us. Because it doesn't have to be a stipulation either. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, if you have something. As far as the street vendors, mobile vending is regulated the same way that restaurants are regulated. We have an entire division that all they do is mobile vending, and they do a lot of enforcement out here. I know that we have many, many task force that work with NYPD about the mobile vendors. But please be assured that because we're just as we are from the restaurants, there are by us or permitted by us, and those a lot of them are vendors who get permits from DCA to vend, but they're not supposed to be doing food, and they come out and they'll sell fruits and vegetables and water and cakes and things, and if you see that, you need to call 311 and report it to us, and, and we'll come out and get rid of them, because they're not licensed to be selling food. I just want to make a comment on the dancing. As it was stated, the, New York, the zoning does control the dancing also controls the dancing. Certain zones do not allow for dancing in a restaurant. I didn't bring the, I didn't bring the guide, and it'll show the breakdown, what type of restaurant can go into which zone, which sells for entertainment, which doesn't. But it is in the, it is in the, um, it is on the website, the city planning website, under accessory of uses. It is listed there. I'm sorry, Ann, you had a question? Yeah. Kind of fairly new, but I just wanted to know what type of relationship have you or do you have with this new night mayor? Does that person do any type of reporting? Uh, to me? Well, yeah, no. to the state. Okay. Um, I've met her. I can. That's pretty much my relationship with her at this point. Um, there's no. The, she works for the city, so I, I'm. I'm sure I'm going. I think you all are probably. Um, because she's supposed to be, from what I understand, and I, I don't, I didn't read the legislation, but from what I understand, she's a, propon a nightlife proponent. So she's supposed to um, help with the relationship between the applicant and the community board, um, and probably with certain areas that are problematic, such as your Roosevelt Avenue or the Lower East Side of Manhattan, and try to come to some types of um, solutions to try to solve the problems that you're having. But you know, I'll, I'll meet with her and, and speak with her when, when it's necessary, but I don't really, she has no reporting requirement to me and I don't have one to her. You have to realize in New York City. Um, so there's a lot you know, uh, do in New York City. And I'd just like to point out that we have a CB4 member in, uh, in attendance who would like to I just, ask. That was the question I was gonna ask. Okay, okay. two birds with one stone. Okay. And another CB3 member in the back. I'm Lisa, I mean, what three? My question is that I have seen bring your own bottle advertised in local papers, and sometimes I'll go by a restaurant. What's the rule about that, the law? Because I thought you weren't, you had to be licensed, and if you're licensed, then. Yeah, you it, 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 unless you're a bottle club. There is a license called a bottle club where you are allowed to bring your own, or if you're a licensed restaurant, you can have a corkage fee, and people can bring their own wine in. But if they're not licensed, they can't. Bring your own. I mean, that would be illegal. But that, all, unless what, uh, or a restaurant that has less than twenty seats. I, I, I uh, am corrected. They, they're allowed to do it if you have less than twenty seats. But the problem, if you have a place that is saying bring your own and it's more than twenty seats, and they're not licensed, that's not the police department. They would bring that. They would go in and and basically get them for unlicensed sale of alcohol. And then if that person then applied, a couple restaurants in Manhattan that are bring your own. I'm just curious, I'm, I'm a longtime member of Community Board 3, and uh, through the years I've heard occasionally within this board, but also anecdotally from the per licenses. Is, is, is that something that, that, that's feasible from, from your perspective? Is that That's not anything that I really have the ability to do. That would be a legislative um, action that the, the senator and, and his folks would have to do, and I'm not really that familiar with, um, I, I don't think you could do it by neighborhood. I think it has to be... Uh, 
political subdivision. Is that how it, the, what the law says? Yes, we're not that familiar with it, but it's not something that we would do. It would have to be legislative. But it has been done. I know that in the past. Yeah, I think it was done in Manhattan, Mike, or? I think there was a period of time where we, the SLA, was trying to do it, and then we felt we weren't allowed to. Okay, so I know it's legislative, but I'm not that familiar with it. And I just have one other question, if you could, could indulge me. For, for the uninitiated, which maybe I consider myself, could you just briefly describe how enforcement works in terms of if there's a violation, the, you guys find, you guys adjudicate it somehow, the first half, what happens first? I assume there's well, a fine. Well, so there's, there's two a, ways we get. Up, up, to, up to revocation. Right, there's two cases. ways we get cases. 90% of our cases across the state, prob approximately, come in from referrals from police departments. Um, meaning that the police, such as the NYPD, will go do an inspection or they'll send an undercover into a bar that's underage and they'll do an underage sale. They are, um, by law, required to refer that to us even though they also have a criminal charge. When we get that referral, it's reviewed by our investigators. The evidence is evaluated and if more evidence needs to be collected, they go out and collect it. If it doesn't, it then goes to a prosecutor who then files the charges. The charges are then sent to the licensee who has an opportunity to respond to them as either guilty or not guilty. And then there's a discussion of settlement or there's not a discussion of settlement. And if there is no discussion of settlement, it heads to hearing. At which point a hearing is scheduled in front of an administrative law judge. We put our case on using either police witnesses or our witnesses and usually both. And then the licensee is permitted to put their case on. The um, legal standard is very low that we have to meet, although it is still a, a standard, and it's substantial, substantial evidence. Um, after the hearing is done, the uh, administrative law judge writes a decision, a written decision, either sustaining or dismissing the charges, depending on, and many times it's, it's one or the other. Uh, there could be up to, I've seen cases with 30 charges, I've seen one charge. Um, and at that point, it then comes in front of our board for punishment. If the charges were sustained, if they were dismissed, we review it and we agree with the ALJ or we can send it, send it back and, and um, or I can overrule the ALJ. Are you typically monetary or, or, or 90, or we probably cancel, we have hearings every, I have hearings every two weeks on, on in probably uh, 12 and 15 licenses, 10 and 15 licenses at every one of those hearings, the rest of them are monetary. And many times the settlement is canceled. Thank you. Mr. Chair, well, I'm coming to the Civic Leader, a coalition of United Residents for a Safer Community. How many inspectors do you have, and how many inspectors do you send to Community Board 3 and 4? Well, like I said, we have, um, our enforcement is driven by complaints. So if we receive a complaint, that's when we go and investigate the complaint. Or if we receive a referral, there might not need any more investigation and the case just starts. And 90% of our cases, give or take, are referrals. Um, overall, across the state, we have 32 investigators? 32. And the majority of them are here in New York City. They are in New York City. Yes. And now that you have casinos upstate and all that, you would need to expand more, I guess. We yeah. really don't, we don't like licenses in casinos. We can legislation was written in the center, can probably speak to it, but I have no idea about it. Okay, that. all right, just ask. No, there are a few special situations. That one, uh, for example, at 31st Avenue is uh, much more residential than uh, the other places that have licenses like uh, Northern Boulevard, the 37th Avenue, Roosevelt Avenue, or Story Boulevard. And they really, uh, and uh, uh, we've had petitions and stuff uh, that uh, they'd like to make that a no uh, liquor license zone. Uh, uh, you know, is, is that feasible? And, and another, uh, when a lot of these people, you, you know, you talk about restaurants, why do they need to be over, open till four o'clock? Well, they answer that. We ask them, and they say, we want to say a soccer game, uh, 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 you know, we want to be able to stay open late. Otherwise, we really want to close early. And, uh, uh, you know, so they apply for a license that 
gives them the right to stay open until four o'clock all year long. Uh, could a license be stipulated? All right, uh, I understand somebody wants to be open late on New Year's Eve and maybe some other situations. Well, they can always come back to us and ask to do that. I mean, I don't, or a New Year's Eve, on New Year's Eve, and they certainly can come back to us and ask to be open that long. As far as a no liquor zone, like I said, that would have to be legislative. That's nothing that we can, I don't think the legislature would want me making that decision or let me make that decision, I can tell you that. So that's something that would have to be legislative. And like I said, I'm not that familiar with that area of the law about how you would um, put- well, What if the community board sort of made a policy that we're not gonna give any licenses on, uh, on, on on 31st Avenue as a blanket uh, policy and uh, publicized. Well, the one the one thing that I have said across the board is I don't, we don't have a blanket policy. I look at every application individually. Mm -hmm. And if a community board told me they had a blanket policy, then they're not really doing their job either. Um, so I don't know that that would be something I would uh, take into account. Mm -hmm. Because I still have to weigh whether it's in the public interest or not. Um, and many places that are already licensed, that wouldn't really be, as far as the landlord goes, if that licensee, he may be a bad actor, it doesn't mean that you can't put a business in there that's a good actor. That would not be a problem in the community. Um, but as far as, you know, putting a moratorium on licenses, that's not something I have the ability to do. If they told me if the legislature told me that's what we're doing in this area, then I would abide by it. I mean, that would be my job, but, but I don't have the ability to do that. I actually have legislation on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I didn't hear you what you said. I actually have legislation on that. Okay. That you guys would do. Yeah, we yeah. have to do it. Yeah, we have to do it. Are there any other comments from the panel to follow up? The only thing I, I, I'd like to end with is the complaints. If you have a problem with a, a particular place, send in a complaint, and we don't we don't sit there and let them pile up. We only need one, and we go check it. I was going to ask: Is there any way you could uh, just announce like an email address so that uh, people know? I don't know them off the top of my head, but I know somebody who does. Just like one, like a main one. Well, on our website, uh, you have to. That's a slanygov www.sla.gov. And it directs you to the complaints, and I think it's enforcement at sla.ny.gov. The community board is cbcomplaints uh, at sla.ny.gov. And my personal email is michael.joan at sla.ny.gov. And I'm happy to review all the complaints. I receive many of them <laughs> at all hours. And I respond at four in the morning, too, when I'm an insomniac, so I feel your pain. Actually, I get surprised when I respond to the 338 email at 405. But uh, yes, we do take them seriously. And I, I just want to add that we have a, a, a council over the last year who's really the one uh, summary suspension of a place, which means it's affecting the public safety, health, or welfare of the community. And he's the one who makes the determination whether he's going to bring a summary suspension and then we, as the board, vote on whether that is um, put in place or not. He's brought more um, in the last year than here to put together. Um, so if you have a particular place that's a big problem, um, you know, that, please send the complaints in because we do not hesitate to, to just shut it, which on the place because they still have to go through the litigation process, but they're, um, <laughs> but I, I think we certainly hope to have us, uh, um, you know, encourage, I think, through uh, your relationship with Mike to perhaps make suggestions for things that you think ought to be on the website uh, that would be informational and helpful that aren't currently. We have a uh, tech savvy young woman who has started working for us over the last six months and she has us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Yeah. And I would... But she's also, and you, you know, she really is, she's actually getting a great deal of praise from um, other agencies because of how active she is on these sites. And 
she um, is also highly involved in the website um, production. So I, I think that she will, uh, or the product, based on what I've seen from her so far, should be very, very good. Um, and please follow us on all those things. And I see a CB3 member just took a picture, so we're going to probably get that over to our Twitter Meister, and he'll get that up as well. Um, and also Community Board 3, besides our website and our email, we also have a Facebook page, so um, you know you can check there for updates and, uh, and whatnot as well. But, uh, but thank you for sharing uh, that contact info. Um, that's very valuable. And uh, at this point, I also want, just want to mention a thank you to Council Member Daniel Drum, who secured a grant to have this and other meetings uh, live streamed and also recorded, and they stay up on YouTube. So this has uh, been a really great evening, a lot of information to digest. But um, you can go back and watch that link on YouTube if you need to re-listen to um, any of the explanations and discussion that went on tonight. So, I can't wait. <laughs> I'm sorry? It's actually probably going to be Community Board 3. The link is, is already up. And uh, if you just go on YouTube and um, do a search for Community Board 3, you might actually see boards from other boroughs because, you know, sometimes there's similar numbers. But uh, it'll be um, under this date because it's there now live. Um, Are all your meetings live streaming? Um, we've been doing them this spring, yeah. Oh. Uh, this winter and spring, so our monthly meetings. Um, but uh, the June one is the last one. But uh, I want to do a great job uh, filming these. Um, and uh, we've kept them busy running from one location to another. And uh, they do a wonderful job. So thank you. And um, uh, so I just want to thank the whole panel. I want to thank uh, uh, Chairman Vincent Bradley from the uh, State Liquor Authority and his colleagues. Also the NYPD from the 110 and 115, Department of Buildings and Department of Health. Um, thank you everyone for coming, um, and uh, I hope you all uh, learned a lot tonight. I know I did too. We had a lot of questions, and we really appreciated uh, everyone giving their time and giving the answers. So thank you, and uh, we appreciate everybody coming. And I just want to thank you all for having me. It's, a, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much.